Welcome to RICO 12. I'm Justin, your host and a grateful child of an all-powerful, all-loving God. RICO 12 is and it is all about exploring the common threads of addiction and sharing tools and hope from those on a similar path. We gather from diverse backgrounds, faiths, and places to learn and support one another. Our speakers represent various fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, reflecting the richness of our shared experiences. Join us in this journey of recovery and unity. Today's speaker for the 222nd 222 meeting is Dr. Judy Hollis, who is a first-time RICO 12 speaker. I'm excited to hear her share and her experience with transferring addictions and obsessions, and we'll get to her talk in the Q&A afterwards here in just a minute, but first for a little bit of business. RICO 12 has several recovery resources in our family of podcasts and social media communities. To learn more, listen more, connect more, or just hang out and learn and grow with us, you can check out the other podcasts, some of them Noodle It Out with Nikki M, uh, the Big Book Roundtable, um, uh, RICO 12 Shares, as well as this one. We've got an Afro Euro Time Zone RICO 12 podcast that actually recorded last night. Um, so we've got a lot of resources throughout the world. So we're grateful to have you here. Uh, to learn more about these podcasts, I'll put some information in the chat of this live meeting, and it will also be in the show notes of the podcast that releases later today. Uh, RICO 12 is self-supporting, and your contributions help us continue our mission. Thank you all who have donated recently and in the past. We had a few come in this week, and just grateful for any of those those uh, donations that come in to help us ex- help us work our 12th step. It's really uh, beneficial to us and to those who uh, need to hear this message. If you would like to also become a spearhead, you can go to www.rico12.com. That's reco12.com forward slash support and donate there either a one-time donation or a monthly spearhead donation. We're grateful for any support you're willing to share if that is where your higher power leads you to, to donate some money. We look forward to each week and each meeting to receiving from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Judy Hollis, and give a little background on her, and then we'll turn the the floor over to her. Dr. Judy Hollis has been an addiction pioneer since 1969 when under Mayor Lindsay's Addiction Services Agency, she helped develop the first therapeutic communities in New York City. Using her countless books, workbooks, recorded lectures, and pamphlets, she has been a tireless campaigner on national and local TV and radio broadcasts, training professionals, and aiding families throughout the world. A chair is being named in her honor at the Keck School of Medicine, offering scholarships and a yearly symposium to study family therapy and a 12-step approach to treating all addictions. Although a gifted and artful professional, she emphasizes that her most vital strength comes from her continuing membership in three 12-step fellowships. Her talk today focuses on the issue of cross-addiction or transferring obsessions and multiple use disorders. If we surrendered to needing help with one part of our self-destructive lifestyles, why why is it so difficult to ask for further help if needed? We'll explore some of the resistances to further surrender and contempt prior to investigation. We'll look at why the final addiction is always the most difficult, what essential ingredient of recovery are we avoiding, and can we see the need for more help, not as a sentence, but as an opportunity. Take it away, Judy. The floor is yours. I will get that PowerPoint up here shared right away. Wow. Thank you so much. And uh, what you didn't know and what I just learned is this is your 222nd broadcast And my top weight before I finally surrendered to 12-step recovery programs, my top weight was 222 pounds. And I always used to say, uh, my top weight is still out there waiting for me. It still is. However, I don't live in the fear that I once did, having been obese all my life and all of that. I'm very, very grateful for coming here and being with you today. And by the way, right underneath my name there, which will go off in a minute, but I'd like to just tell you that my email is my name, Judy, J-U-D-I-H-O-L-L-I-S at AOL.com. Uh, reason being one, I just sent out a new newsletter yesterday after one year of not giving out any newsletters. And uh, 
if you want that newsletter, I'll send it to you if you ask me. And also the talk I'm going to do today, I have condensed from an hour long talk down to a 20 minute talk. So uh, if you want a copy of the extended one along with audio, I can send that to you. So please do. And just to say hi or ask about anything or schedule a phone call or anything, just get me at J-U-D-I. H-O-L-L-I-S at AOL.com. All right. So if you can see up there on the screen, the title of today's talk is not is one program enough, but it's really transferring obsessions. And what I have up there is a copy of two pamphlets that I wrote for Hazelden in 1985. Actually, it's a series of seven pamphlets that are now out of print. Do not order them on the internet because there are people charging goo gobs of too high money for these little pamphlets. Uh, I can get the the information to you. Uh, I don't know where that money goes and who these people are, but I have nothing to do with uh, the sale of these right now. So Anyway, in 1985, I saw some things I started thinking about, and here I am today in almost 2025 with the same things. The pamphlets were titled Transferring Obsessions and When AAs Go to OA. And it spoke to, both of the pamphlets speak to the idea of when we find we have yet another addiction to deal with. Uh, By the way, the the slides continue to go, which we don't want to have happening right now. There we go. Okay. So, um, Transferring obsessions, we find we have another illness we have to deal with, even thinking that uh, everything should be handled by what our first uh, surrender program was for, like, shouldn't my AA program be enough? Shouldn't it be enough that I work with an AA sponsor and I've surrendered, uh, supposedly? Why do I keep gaining weight or keep gambling or keep having love addictions or whatever my things are? Shouldn't AA fix it all? The answer is no, Uh, which comes to the title of the second pamphlet, When AAs Go to OA, finding all the addiction, uh, all the resistances that come up to is just not fair and I shouldn't have to, and I'm sentenced to all of these programs. No, 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 no. I hope... uh, By my quick talk today, you will feel invited to join me. So far, I am in three recovery programs, and I'm juggling them all, and I don't have time either. But let's proceed now uh, to the second slide here. Uh, My most important criteria for being able to do this thing is that I surrendered to recovery. And you see there my before picture. And my after picture, and that before picture was taken in a market in Bangkok, Thailand, two years before I surrendered to these programs. And a lady uh, from the marketplace, one of the sellers, came up to me, and she she had never seen anything like me. And, and she went and she kept pushing in my arm to see if it would pop out. She thought I was kind of a balloon, a blown up balloon. She'd never seen anyone that fat. And these kind of things are what we catalog later as our, we paid our dues, painful and incomprehensible demoralization. And that's what I felt in that marketplace. Uh, I had a spiritual experience soon after And then two years later, I got involved in these programs. So let's move to the next slide, please. So we're always saying it should be enough for me to handle just in my AA program. I believe that'll be slide number four. There are many other programs um, that you can avail yourself of. It's not enough just to try to do it in one program. And slide number five, please. I think I, yeah. So people always say, you know, Patrick Carnes, a very uh, 
well-known writer for Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, he said, transferring obsessions is like switching chairs on the Titanic. Now, what we did find with people who go into a secondary obsession, let's say an alcoholic who thinks they can smoke marijuana or an alcoholic who feels they're sober, but they continue to gain weight and have many medical problems. Uh, what we found is that people who go to a second thing often go back to the mothership that it'll Smoking marijuana will lead you back to alcohol. So I want to tell you about a good friend of mine. Her name was Ann W., and she was a big AA speaker. She drove like crazy all over the L.A. County area every night, going to a meeting, being the speaker, advertising how much she loved uh, AA and, and her recovery. Now, Anne secretly had diabetes. She never mentioned at any of these meetings. And she was found in her shower, and her whole apartment was strewn with jelly beans. So her AA program did not help her from dying of another addiction. So we often get into debates, well, which is more important? <laughs> They're all important. So let's go to the next slide, please. So why, when we say, oh, numero uno should handle it, my AA program should handle it, what we forget is what the essential ingredient in AA is that one fellow sufferer is showing you how they're walking out of the addiction. So the main message we get when we get into any of these programs is people saying, they don't say it out loud necessarily, but they say, we know how hard it is. We know it's difficult. We're not going to say, well, just eat in moderation. Just push yourself away from the table. Just follow my 1200 calorie diet. You know, whatever these people are saying, they're very often well meaning, but they are not fellow sufferers. So um, going to the second third, fourth, or fifth program helps us to stop minimizing how difficult it is. It takes us out of denial, which stands for I don't even notice I am lying to myself. So next slide, please. I'm going quickly because we've condensed. So we always say that the last the last addiction is the most difficult. And why is that? Because it's the last, right? There's nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. We're still using a certain behavior or a substance to take the edge off. Well, so very often food is the last one. In my case, food was my first one that I surrendered to. So a lot of things are involved, this is true in alcohol and in eating, about the cultural acceptance of excess, okay? And studies were done in the 1960s comparing two cultures, French and Italian. And they looked at what is the cultural acceptance of excess. This was in terms of alcoholism. So they found that in France, people were encouraged to get publicly drunk, and you're so cute with that lampshade on your head, right? And now we have people saying, hey, let's go down shots, why don't we? <laughs> and we're competing for how stupid we can look when we get drunk. However, when they studied drinking in Italy, they found there was not that same indulgence motto. They said, hey, drink at home, drink around the dinner table, do not be drunk and disorderly, savor your wine. So what did we find in this study was that in France, there was a very high rate of alcoholism, and in Italy, a low rate. Just saying, 
Just something to think about. I'm trying to tell you your culture is forcing you into continuing to transfer to more and more addiction. Unfortunately, we're the richest country in the world and we have the highest rate of addiction and getting worse. Next slide, please. And in terms of the eating thing, we are really enforcing and indulging the idea of excess. The whole fat acceptance movement. Yes, I don't want people to be ridiculed for being fat. I've been on television debating a lot of these issues, but I also don't want it to be encouraged. It's not healthy. But we're getting worse and worse. All of our clothes sizes are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we have Lizzo out there shaking it, baby. Let's, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be one of those warning people about your health risks because warning never stops any addict from any behavior. Next slide, please. So here we come to the issues of accepting I need another program. First of all, when I, I've been working in addictions for longer than I've been in recovery, to tell you the truth. And what I keep telling people that I train and work with is this is not an adjustment model. We are not trying to help people become normal in this society I just described to you, which is so full of addiction and encouragement to excess. So. Do you really want to be normal in this society that's about com competition and winning? Or would you like to enter the fourth dimension? The ticket of admission is humility. Admitting, I've tried my best and it got me right here. I'm going to ask a fellow sufferer for some help. Next slide, please. So I want to offer you recovery program, the next one, the next one, the next one, as an invitation rather than a condemnation. You know, we often uh, read in our literature, if you want what we have and you're willing to go to any lengths to get it, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't necessarily want what you have but I do seek what you seek. I want to be with fellow sufferers. That means I'm going to be in a state of perpetual longing. There will always be a slight ache of my wanting excess. I had to accept that. In my earliest days in recovery, I, I called my sponsor nearly every half hour and she said to me one afternoon, sweetheart, nobody dies of starvation between lunch and dinner. <laughs> you can make it. Hold on. Go in a room and write. So what we get to learn when we look at transferring obsessions it re is really there's nothing you can eat, drink, buy, or kiss that makes any difference. You eventually have to face that enough is never enough. Now, one of my favorite guys, Thomas Merton, who was a, uh, a Benedictine monk who served a lot of time in China, he said, I didn't become a monk to suffer more than other people. I became a monk to suffer more effectively than other people. OK, so I want to learn from my suffering. I want to grow from my suffering. I want to have a handle on it. It's one reason I became a therapist, to try to figure it out. Some of the things I figured out were while I was standing in front of a refrigerator, <laughs> shoveling, shoveling. And I could turn from that refrigerator light, that dazzling light, and I could explain to you why I was doing the behavior. But how do I stop it? 
how do I walk out of this? I One of my teachers is a guy who talks about being horn deep in the ditch. Okay? I'm horn deep in the ditch. <laughs> Above my eyes, how do I get out of this ditch? And that's what I need another fellow sufferer for. Show me how you walk it. Don't give me your advice about what our studies have found. No. Just tell me, well, what would you do? How do you handle that? And we have a worldwide fellowship of all of these programs. And there's a lot of people we can consult with. And guess what? It's free of charge. It's fabulous. So, um... I think I might have gotten mixed up on my slides. I'm not sure. Can you, is there another one? <laughs> Just, well, ah, here we go. Is further, further, little bit of self-promotion. If you want to get to me, just email me at J-U-D-I-H-O-L-L-I-S at AOL.com. Judy Hollis at AOL.com. And I'll make a phone date to meet with you later and talk further. So I push this through. There's a lot more. You can email me and I'll send you the entire hour long thing. But I wanted to make sure we have a lot of time for questions and answers because that's my favorite part. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Judy. I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoint there and get back to where we're at. Perfect. Thank you so much, Judy. I really appreciate you sharing your experience, strength, and hope there. I've written down several questions, and I would like to invite the audience here. If you have a question for Judy, please type it in the Q&A link at the bottom of your window. It looks like two speech bubbles over the top of each other, and we'll get to those questions as we go along here. So first of all, Judy, I would like to, to have you um, – expand just a little bit. Talk about the concept and the importance of surrender or abandoning self. I mean, you talked about, I needed to surrender myself in each of these programs. What does that look like? What does that concept look like? Because to someone like me, who is your, I guess, average American male who says, I have to do it all myself. Surrender is the last thing I'm ever going to do. I will die before surrendering. Talk to us about the importance and the vitalness of surrender. Okay. Well, the third recovery program I surrendered to first was Overeaters Anonymous, then was Al-Anon, and then the last one for me was AA. Uh, all those years working as an alcoholism counselor and trainer, I never thought my problem, I, I felt I had great control over it, what you're talking about, a kind of macho thing of I can handle this. I had my line in the sand. I will never drink in Los Angeles. You know, poop where you eat. This is my job, right? Until I crossed my last line. I finally drank in Los Angeles. Consternation. What? So I had to go to AA meetings where many of my former patients were there and they were having celebrations of five and 10 years sobriety. They ask for newcomers. I raised my hand. And afterwards, my patients came over to me and they said, what are you doing here? And what did I say? I don't know. I don't know. That's what surrender looks like. I was so smart. The smarter ones take longer. I had such knowledge about these illnesses. For me to drag myself in and sit in the back of the room and cry and say, I don't know. I don't know myself. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm self-destructive. After many years of therapy, by the way. So I call it drool time. I don't come to these rooms to perform and look good and do my tap dance. I come in to sit quietly and absorb the love and support and encouragement and wisdom that you guys have. So 
I've always kept a very low profile in my 12-step meetings. I'm there to listen and learn. So I hope that answers your question. And by the way, one of those pamphlets I mentioned was called Accepting Powerlessness. And we talked about the research showing that people who are in a really good stage of acceptance, denial, anger, bargaining, finally acceptance, in acceptance, they say, uh, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't have a new diet that promises X, Y, Z or a new shot in my belly or any of that. I don't have a clue. I love that perspective because, you know, um, well, I actually took that when I went into my second room of recovery, went to my second uh, addiction of like, you know, this I'm, I'm dying because of this addiction now. I thought I had everything under under control in the previous one, but I'm dying in, well, it was food addiction was my second one. And uh, went into those rooms and got a sponsor and said, I am going to try and forget everything I think I know about the 12 steps. And that's why I do the set aside prayer every time I, uh, every time I start this meeting and often when I have meetings with sponsees and stuff. So tell me a little bit more about the importance of saying, I I'm starting afresh, no matter if I've got 15 years in AA or 25 years in Al-Anon and starting afresh. Why is that so important? Um, actually if the longer version of this talk talks a lot about the resistances and uh, one is kind of uh, knowing, knowing it all, being too smart. And, uh, you know, if you go to another recovery program and you find yourself, you're listening, but you're nodding like, oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, Jay, I learned that. Eh, 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 eh. Knowing is a big part of the problem. It has to be, you know, like I came in saying, you know, I'm going to do everything they tell me to, as stupid as it might sound, because I know it's not going to work. And then I'm going to kill myself. That's exactly what my backstory was. I'm going to dare them to help me. And so I became, I said, okay, you want me to do that? I'll do that. Okay, okay. And guess what? I did everything they said, and I'm living a glorious life now. It wasn't easy, and I had to give up a lot of my attachments to food, sex, rock and roll, uh, to men, to houses, to cars, to jobs. Let it go. How important is it? Making it my primary purpose. And by the way, if you email me, I'll send you a link to the new bridge meetings where they've created some meetings for AA people who are contemplating they might have a food problem. They can go to these meetings and help make that transition from, I've got a great AA recovery and all that I know, uh, and I'm still having a problem with food in this case. It's called the, o go to oabridge.org. If you don't come to me and you'll find the meetings. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit then, if this goes for you, about AA snobbery, you know, that we're the big daddy program. And when I first came in, oh, many years ago, obviously, and they would say, um, oh, little lady. And they always had like a Southern accent and kind of a tough guy thing. Little lady, I spilled more booze on my shirt than you ever drank. Right? It was like uh, a status to be a badass, you know? And I found myself wanting to enhance my AA history to be, you know, I wanted to talk some of the dirty stuff. I wanted to. Show I had been in the gutter too. Uh, uh, all of that kind of stuff has got to go. Uh, all of that uh, competition between the programs. <laughs> because uh, people are getting hurt as a result. Yeah, I, I love that uh, concept of 
doesn't matter if I'm a low, low, low bottom drunk eater, sex addict, whatever it may be, or someone who's just realized I have lost all power and control. I am a slave to this substance or this behavior, and I can't do it anymore. Um, I, I've, I've sponsored a couple of people who have said my story is nowhere powerful enough to identify with people. And how, how do you deal with that when somebody comes in with a high bottom, but they find that they find the solution and they're on fire and they want to share with others, but they're like, my bottom isn't low enough. Nobody's going to identify with me. How do you address that? Wow. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Fabulous question. Uh, Ha, huh. you know, uh, you walked in, you asked me, right? I mean, why are you arguing with me? There are better things to do on a Friday afternoon than walk into a church basement with a bunch of people puking in the back of the room. I mean, come on, you're asking for help. Uh, how lucky you are that you caught it where it seems to be manageable to you. You don't have, you know, we created treatment programs. That's what my new book is about, all the early days of treatment. We created treatment programs so that people wouldn't have to, quote unquote, hit bottom. You didn't have to be a skid row drunk. You could be at a higher level where your withdrawals weren't as great and uh, your periods of drinking weren't as great and all of it. Why do you have to have your throat cut before you? are open to getting some help, huh? I mean, really. Uh, and in our culture, especially with the food thing, we are so encouraged to find our own solution. We don't tell alcoholics, just read this women's magazine and you'll know how to get sober. But we tell overeaters, we got a new diet, we got a new drug. We, oh, by the way, speaking of the new drug idea, and in my newsletter, I address this question about the new Ozempic and, and that uh, line of drugs. You know, in New York City in the early 70s, I was working in some of the early methadone maintenance programs, right? And methadone was the great new drug to get heroin addicts off heroin. And it was non-addicting. Remember that word? Always remember that word. If you're in any doctor's office and they prescribe you anything, you ask, what are the side effects? What's the addictive property? They don't even know. They need to look it up a lot of the time. But there's no free lunch. Any of these Quick all, I mean, let's see. Ozempic seems to be the latest, greatest. We'll see. I watched methadone become addictive. It wasn't the drug, it was the person. And the essay I'm writing about this is do we treat the drug or the person? Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing those that and those are great questions to look at and go. Is, well, what are the benefits? What are the counter benefits or the, the side effects to these? We've got a couple of questions that have come in from the live audience. The first one's from an anonymous attendee, Judy. It says, you have mentioned about needing more than one program. I would say my main two are codependency and food. However, I also have issues with fantasy, love, validation, Al-Anon, compulsive spending, things that just keep popping up. Has working your main programs lifted some of the other things you do so that you don't need 365 programs? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, the whole relationship package is probably one package, whether it's Al-Anon, codependency, adult children of alcoholics, they're all about, and a lot of my writing is about relationships. Our primary, most important relationship is with food. It's the most intimate experience any of us have. We take the outside environment, we ingest it, we use our own juices to break it down and create what? new cells, new parts of us. So if you have a food problem, you have a relationship problem. So any of the relationship programs will help you about establishing personal boundaries and how to act in relation to other people. And your food program will help you also sense your own boundaries because when you get around people that make your hairs of your arms stand on end 
The body doesn't lie. The head lies. Oh, I can handle that guy. I've got someone I'm working with now. Oh, she just loves these younger men. Mm -mm -mm. She knows it ends the same place, but it's exciting and fun. All those bright, shiny objects out there. So I believe the food problem keeps us closest to the bone, keeps our body slightly raw so that we're, you know, we're sensitive and we are aware of uh, let me just say this one little story. Uh, a Buddhist monk was at a, a party for New York literati people. And this uh, full of herself lady came up to him. He was wearing the robes and all. And she said, tell me about Buddhism. What about Buddhism? He said, well, you want the short version or the long version? Oh, come on. It's a party. Just the short version. So he said, well, the short version is pay attention. She didn't like that. Okay, give me the long version. He said, well, the long version is pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. So any program that asks you to pay attention, even to what's going in your mouth, even if it's a crumb that you're picking up from the table, any opportunity to pay attention will get you well, will keep you healing yourself. And that might switch from time to time. It doesn't mean you have to go to 25 programs every week. You may have to, like recently, I was dealing with my husband's illnesses and my managing and controlling and fear. So I had to up my Al-Anon programs, which I hadn't been to in a while. I was always a teabag Al-Anon. I'll only go when I get in hot water. But uh, I had to, to do more of that meeting and less of some other meetings to, uh, to keep me centered about staying inside my own hula hoop and minding my own business and not offering advice unless I'm asked. Whew, tough job. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I love the, the, the story you gave on the, you know, define Buddhism, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, and how that applies to, well, you talked about with food, whether it's a crumb you pick up off the table or a single item that you, that you mindlessly sample, walk by and grab a grape off the table and throw it in or whatever it may be, you know, those mindless things. And that can apply to any, I think any addiction, affliction, whatever it may be, pay attention to what I'm either ingesting through my eyes, my mouth, my hands, my whatever it may be, and just pay attention to that. Thank you for sharing those those words of, of wisdom. Uh -huh. So the, the next question that comes in from our live audience, another anonymous attendee, um, is one that I wanted to touch on too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this a little bit with with mine and then I'm gonna read this question. You know, so often you know, I've heard the concept of the ISM, alcoholism, ism. Um, and that the ism is what the, the the malady is. It isn't the alcohol for Alcoholics Anonymous. It isn't the sex for the sex addict. It isn't the food for the food addict. It's the ism, the 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 thing inside. So, here's here's the question from the anonymous attendee: As a therapist, do you think all the labels we have for mental health, such as depression, anxiety, bipolar, um, AGHD, I don't know what that is, etc., are just untreated alcoholism. My therapist thinks I may have bipolar disorder, and I am very resistant to it. I believe another way to refer to all these labels is simply untreated alcoholism or untreated trauma. What are your thoughts on that? Wow. Okay. So, you know, I learned early in my training as a therapist not to give people uh, advice. Uh, because you have to live with the advice. I don't. Okay? So uh, I am very, very, very much against most labels and diagnoses. All right? Now we have, we've gone into uh, SUD, substance use disorder. Uh, okay. How does that help the gamblers? Well, we'll see. Anyway, uh, you know, all these great diagnoses, I think your question is right on. Uh, all these great diagnoses, what do we what do we want them for? We want them to get the right drug to fix it, or what we want to wear it on our t-shirt. Well, this is who I am. 
You know, uh, this explains how I am. So maybe I'm not responsible for my behavior because of what they did or I did. You know, it's and and when I get around people, they like to they like to tell me about their family member and he's a ex, uh, like you say, bipolar or this or that or the other. What the heck does it mean? I mean, I found this a lot in my treatment programs uh, where counselors would come in and they would talk about, uh, well, she's a victim of incest. Mm. Well, what what does that mean? What is well, you know, incest. I'd say to the counselor, go back to the patient, ask her to tell you what happened and how it affected her. A lot of things happen that don't really have a negative effect. We just the label, we want to add it. We don't know. So she'd go back. This one case I remember, I the next week she came in, she said, Well, what it was is that her dad used to walk around the house in his boxer shorts. And, you know, she would see something. And a counselor told her, well, that's sex abuse. Well, maybe, maybe not. It, the important thing for each of us to do is to be honest with ourselves about what really did affect us. And maybe it didn't. And it's not going to help to know your diagnosis. I'm sorry. You see, we've taken spiritual and artful concepts, and we've adopted the medical model. And it's getting worse and worse. I watched this progression, which is what I'm writing about in my book, about the early days of treatment versus where we are now. And of course, I have my biases and my judgments about it. But uh, no matter what you're prescribed, no matter what label you're given, this is your one and only glorious life. Find somewhere with people who are helping you walk out of this. Our 12-step programs are hopeful. They're not depressing. Okay? Yeah, so so with that... Um... What is your, I mean, you talked about the labels and the, the diagnoses of these different things. What are you, what's your take on labeling yourself as a, an addict, an alcoholic, a, a food addict, whatever it may be? What are, what are your ideas and thoughts behind that? Well, you know, I, uh, I rarely use those terms in terms of myself. And I rarely talk about myself in, in those negative descriptions. I don't really mean negative, but uh, um, I talk about my membership in recovery programs. I am advertising. I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And people say, you still go to those meetings after 44 years of sobriety? Why? And I say, because I love this way of life. It is walking me out of my self-destruction which you and I are talking about manifests in many different ways. Or I will say I'm a member of Overeaters Anonymous. I don't need to give you the label. There's too many labels. I need to talk about my recovery. So I'm not sure I answered your question, really. Did I? Well, I, I think it's very helpful, you know, in the in the big book, it says, hey, when you identify yourself in public, you know, identify yourself as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, don't don't necessarily have to say, you know, name or whatever else in, in the tradition of anonymity and confidentiality. But um, yeah, I think you did answer that, that after 44 years of sobriety, maybe that label that brought you or the 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 struggle, the the addiction, the the ism that brought you into the rooms, is not necessarily the same thing that keeps you in the rooms. It's it's the growth that keeps you in the rooms. Am I am I interpreting that correctly? Can you expand uh, a l- little bit on yeah, that? Yeah, I think I think pretty much. Uh, if I do use a label, I will say I am a recovering compulsive overeater, ing, recovering alcoholic, recovering alanomic. Um, always in recovery, but I'll, I'll just give this caveat because this transferring obsessions topic is very involved. I'm getting a lot of flack, good, bad, and indifferent. I forgot to mention, but it's in the longer talk about uh, 
Bill Wilson uh, in 1958 wrote a pamphlet about this issue and saying that we have to close our doors to all these people with all these other things because uh, we we need to be a safe haven for the alcoholic seeking recovery. And we have to attract the recovering alcoholic, not all these other people. Uh, but one of the guys who goes to my regular programs, he said, I didn't come here seeking the light. I came here escaping the heat. <laughs> so I don't want to get too airy fairy here about how much I love the growth process and how much I am excited and enjoy and lightness because I still have days when that grape or in my case nut when those nuts on the counter are calling to me and then it's between me and my devil and uh it doesn't matter what the what the label is i i have to recognize pay attention to those moments when i need help i need to make the phone call i've had people help me walk stuff over to the garbage disposal and I'm on the phone and we put it down and I throw the switch and shh, that episode is over. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Th th thank you, Judy. Um, I want to shift just a little bit into something that I'm noticing a lot in my own life, as well as in people that I sponsor in their lives that, uh, you know, the, the transference to like scrolling and social media and screen addiction, just not being able to put those things down and wasting hours and hours and days and days on those things. Talk to us a little bit about how, I mean, do you think that's another program that maybe, well, someone like myself should look into or what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I feel so sad about it. You know, people complain to me. They can't. They text me and I don't respond. I don't have any notifications on my phone. I uh, am very careful to maintain the timing of when I'm responding to incoming. Uh, very dangerous. And I, and I saw it right from the beginning. I don't have a social media presence. I'm being encouraged now to develop that. I'm not sure if I want to hear about it, but uh, I might go there carefully, carefully, carefully. Uh, yeah, anything that's robbing your moments. And that's partly why I'm not on all this. The learning curve for someone of my generation is just too time consuming. And, uh, and, and I don't feel the same connection and satisfaction that I do talking to someone on the phone. I can pick up the nuance and understand each other rather than, oh, so many people like to text a mean phrase. They're really courageous <laughs> texting, huh? Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I just, I have guarded myself against going there knowing my addiction. I have found myself down rabbit holes when I'm interested in learning something. And I say, whoa, you know, um, I feel great compassion for the people who are addicted to it. And I think it would, it would help to name it as their addiction. Yeah. And, and I think this is the way you've described that is another way to look at pay attention, pay attention. How, how am I reacting? How am I feeling? What is happening? as I'm doing this, is this helpful? Is this helpful? You know? There you go. Yeah. So we've yeah. got two more questions from our live audience here, and we'll get to those here real quick before we start closing out here in a few minutes. The first one is from an, another anonymous attendee. This person asks, in your food program, have you quit any foods altogether? I don't see myself allergic to any foods as I can compulsively eat anything. To me, it's my behaviors around food. I can't stop obsessing about it. And once I start the behavior, I can't stop. So talk to us a little bit about your experience with that, Judy. Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, my brief answer is from time to time. <laughs> I have indulged from time to time. I have resisted from time to time. I ha I've been in OA 49 years. I've done it all. I've done all the, the weight loss gimmicks and the shots and the pills and the, uh, 
the, the new diet. Uh, so initially, though, it was very helpful to me to use that AA model of I'm addicted to solid sugar. Alcohol is liquid sugar. I'm addicted to solid sugar, which also means carbs, which break down to sugar. So my first 20 some years in Overeaters Anonymous was very rigid food plan, write down, weigh and measure, call in the early days, and then eventually email to another fellow sufferer because of what I was going to eat or did eat. Because the important thing is to be witnessed, to stay honest, not to leave it in your own squirrely head. Because, you know, left to my own devices, I say, well, uh, ice cream is really a protein. I mean, it's uh, milk, right? So eventually I'm saying ice cream is fish. I think I'll have it for dinner. Right? So that's where my mind goes. So anyway, this is what I want to say is that, and I was doing retreats for OA all around the country, and I was the superstar and had a lot of good stuff to say and still do. But at about 20 years, which I think happened to also fall on OA's 21st birthday, and I spoke at their conference, and I said, you know, we're, OA is now 21 years old. We are now adults. It is what the job of an adult is to learn from their daddy's experience, in this case, AA, learn from daddy, and then adapt to what works for us, right? So I announced at this retreat in Chicago that with my sponsor's guidance, that I was going to experiment with some foods I hadn't had in all that time. That maybe I'll go out to dinner with my husband and I'll have a bite of his dessert. And it progressed to I'll have a half of a slice or, or whatever. Well, when I announced that I was going to be doing this with my sponsor to watch what effects it had on my recovery, people went ballistic with me. They said, are you trying to tell alcoholics to drink? I said, no. I'm trying to say that maybe the food deal is a bit different and that maybe with a lot of recovery under my belt, I can have more awareness, pay attention, make choices, dare I say, become a normie. Oh, no. Oh, no. That was too scary. But I want to tell you, for the last many years after that, that's basically been uh, my recovery with food. And, you know, in the longer presentation, I talk about having respect for your worthy adversary. Like Native Americans bowed down to the buffalo before they went on the hunt. I don't say I am masterful over food, but I say I can live in the world and not be afraid. And, uh, I still am very mindful of what I'm going to eat each day, what my activity level is going to be, what my events are going to be, what my obligations to speak clearly are going to be. All of that's considered before I decide about the food. So for the past 15 to 18 years, my weight has stayed the same. My dress size has stayed the same. My body's moving beautifully. It is aging. But uh, what can I tell you? I am in the world and respectful of my addiction. Thank you for sharing that and that bit of hope. Now, um, you were 20 years in when you made that decision and it wasn't, you know, hey, I'm, I've been sober for six months. Now I need to do this, right? So that's something that I think is important to do. All right. So we've got another question uh, and we'll wrap this up really quick. This this question comes in from Nancy. Nancy says, how do you feel about members of AA taking cakes who are very heavy or very thin and obviously into food addictions or members of OA who are drinking excessively and whose behavior is out of control taking a candle? Does this set a bad example? for newcomers. Thoughts on that, Judy? Oh, definitely. Yes. I want to say that my 
number one feeling is compassion. I spent most of my life in that denial. And uh, you couldn't have convinced me that it was any different. So I, I hope that they'll see the light. I do think that uh, newcomers have a perfect right to be judgmental and say, what the heck are you trying to tell me when blah, blah? Um, I do want to be an example for others. And uh, I do want to... I want to carry an honest message. That's why I told you I don't restrict any foods anymore. That's just the honest truth about my life. And it seems to be working. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. One more real quick question from Mary Lee and our live audience. Do you meditate, Judy? Uh, Yes, I do. Uh, I've been spent some time in some Buddhist monasteries. I have a gratitude shrine in my backyard where I don't spend a lot of time, but I just uh, I have various objects there that I am grateful. It reminds me of aspects of my life I'm grateful for, and I like to pay attention to that. Also, I learned meditation with your eyes open so that you always had a sense of the periphery. You didn't leave, you were present. So that I meditate, I can meditate on a New York City subway. I just go, whoa. And I'm there, I'm looking, but I'm, uh, I'm inside. Okay? So, uh, Whatever method you can find, guided meditation. Right now, my major meditation is yoga because I'm always healing that mind-body split. Yoga uh, has similar concepts as Buddhism and meditation. And I want to breathe into my body, sort of. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate your experience of being able to meditate and your sh- shares of that. Do you have any final words of wisdom to share for us before we start closing up? Yes. What I have always said to newcomers who are wanting to deal with their food, what I say is avoid cellophane. Now, what does that mean? Only eat real food, nothing that has to rip open a package. Okay? That would be your first step on the road to where we want to go and stay visible. Don't lie. Don't have any secrets. Just put it out there. Next. I had a slip. Next. And that's why I object to counting days in Overeaters Anonymous. I realize the value coming from the AA experience, but I want the person who has an extra this or a blah, blah, to just say, yeah, that was today, next. So uh, I still have difficulty at OA. When they say, what's your length of abstinence? I like to say, I call it my sustenance. The way I eat sustains me in this way of life. I don't abstain from anything except alcohol still. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing those words of wisdom. Big thanks to Judy for a fantastic RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting. If we missed your question, if anybody else out there has any additional questions, uh, please consider joining our WhatsApp community. You can send an email to me at RICO12POD at gmail.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2-P-O-D at gmail.com. Uh, to join in that conversation, you can also send an email to Judy at uh, uh, Judy Hollis at AOL.com as she shared her e- email address here. Um, I Ask any questions you have there. And if you haven't already done this, please consider going and rating and reviewing uh, Rico 12 Podcast on Apple Podcasts. It's a powerful way to work your work our, our 12th step and getting this message out to more people who could benefit from it. Um, next week, uh, we will be hearing from Chuck H., who is another first-time Rico 12 speaker. Excited about all these first-timers that are coming in. We're getting new, new blood, new energy, and I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Uh, excited to hear from him. As a note of interest, I'm booking guest speakers for the month months of April and May right now. So if you out there are, are thinking about being a guest speaker, please reach out to me at rico12pod at gmail.com. 
let me know and we'll get things rolling. Uh, and stay tuned on the WhatsApp community and on our email list for more information on that and on it, all the other projects we've got coming up. There's some cool stuff happening here. So let's launch off into the rest of our day with a prayer. Judy, do you have a prayer for us that you'd like to launch us off with? Oh, my, of course. Yes. Um, but I. Uh, oh, here we go. All right. And, you know, everything is great with that set aside prayer, which is really good. But uh, and I love all the program prayers. But here's something I kind of adapted from many things here. OK. <clears throat> uh oh. Well, I, I cut off the first part of it. But anyway, it's asking the forces of the universe that I seek after, though I do not see. Please keep me in an attitude of gratitude. Help me remember to breathe in. Grant me the, the grace to listen and learn. Please keep me teachable. Please keep me from thinking I must share at every meeting. Help me to keep confidences and respect boundaries and avoid judgment and gossip. Help seal my lips from giving advice unless asked. Please remind me that I may be wrong and that they may be right. Keep me from feeling I must straighten others out. Please help me remember that I'm sorry is a healthy beginning phrase in the process of making amends. And somehow my computer isn't letting me get the last of it. Do you have it there? Mine's actually cut off there too. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> well, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, everybody. Remember... Everybody, keep coming back. When you come back, sit all the way down. Come all the way in. Sit all the way down. Stay and uh, keep doing it. Let's trudge this road of happy destiny together. Work it. You are worth it. There was a man put his hand by the side of his mouth. And he wanted to scream, but the sound never came out.
Die.